start from the time that people started to think about time in seconds. So this is well into uh, a modern era because it wasn't until people started to make mechanical clocks that you could in fact tick off seconds. And even the first of those mechanical clocks uh, weren't able to, uh, to divide time into seconds. There were old clocks. There's uh, an old clock that only has one, uh, one hand that only indicates hours and not minutes, let alone seconds. But at some point, people made clocks that were uh, uh, precise enough that they could tick off seconds. A, uh, a clock with a pendulum uh, that is one meter long has a period uh, of two seconds, and this is often called a seconds pendulum because half of a swing is, uh, is one second, and a clock like that can, can actually cause a mechanical hand to tick off seconds. And ever since we've had seconds, as far as I know, a second has been defined to be a certain fraction of a day. So a day has 24 hours, there are uh, 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 60 minutes in an hour, there are 60 seconds in a minute, so that tells you what a second is. Then the question is, what is day? Uh, if you talk about a solar day, the, the time between uh, noon and noon, where noon is defined as the time that where the sun is highest in the sky, that varies by a lot during the year because the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is elliptical, uh, and uh, the tilt of the Earth's axis on which it rotates is tilted relative to the, to the plane in which the, uh, uh, the Sun orbits. So this results in significant changes of the, uh, what's called the solar day. So at some point, people defined the second to be a certain fraction, this 24 times 60 times 60, of the mean solar day, averaging the solar day over the whole year. And astronomers were very good at being able to make those averages. So we had a, uh, a definition of the second that was fairly reliable, at least for the kinds of things that people needed to do before the 20th century. But by the time of the beginning of the 20th century, there were clocks that were actually better than the Earth clocks that kept time so precisely that they could tell that the mean solar day was changing. And there are lots of reasons why this happens. The tides are a kind of a friction force on the rotation of the Earth that slow it down. There are other things, earthquakes change the distribution of mass in the Earth and that uh, can uh, change the, the rotation rate. Uh, most people are familiar with watching uh, skaters who start a spin and then uh, bring their arms in and speed up. Well, if you do that to the mass of the Earth because something happens inside or uh, you get more uh, accumulation of ice at the poles or less accumulation because ice caps melt, this changes the rotation right of the Earth. All these things go into uh, making the second defined that way as not being a good uh, definition and time. It, it means that your unit of time is not something you can count on as being uh, a constant. So toward the middle of the 20th century, people developed what are known as atomic clocks, where the ticker, the thing that, that, uh, uh, that keeps time for that clock, are the vibrations or the, uh, the natural frequencies of atoms. Atoms have certain energy levels, which we learned at the beginning of the 20th century is due to quantum mechanics. And one of the things that's marvelous about this is that every atom of the same kind is absolutely identical to every other atom of that kind. And the international community agreed by uh, about 1967 that they were going to choose a particular atom, cesium, uh, and define the frequency of um, uh, that corresponds to the energy difference between two of the energy levels in that atom. And it doesn't matter where the cesium comes from, uh, you're going to get exactly the same frequency. And that's one of the beauties of this thing. So people can make these clocks all over the world and be guaranteed they're keeping the same amount of time. These clocks are amazing. 
in by about 1990 these clocks were good to about a part in 10 to the 14. That's a part in 100 million million. So in other words, if you made one and you made another, they would agree to a part in 100 million million. That was about all you could do with those clocks because the atoms that are used as the tickers are moving so fast. And there's a lot of reasons why you might think that it's hard to make measurements on fast atoms. One is they just don't stay around long enough to make a good measurement. There are also things like Einstein's time dilation. Einstein in 1905 taught us that time is relative. It depends on how fast you're moving relative to the clock you're looking at. And those clocks are moving really fast and that shifts their frequency and you have to take that into account. So that made it very difficult to make these clocks any better than a part in 10 to the 14. That's where my research group at NIST and other research groups around the world started to do experiments to learn how to slow the atoms down. We started in uh, the late 1970s and by the 1990s we had made cesium atoms so much colder, which means so much slower, than what uh, had been used in atomic clocks that we could make a huge impact on how good these clocks were. As a result of those uh, improvements, making the cesium atoms go really, really slowly, instead of more than 100 meters per second, we have them at one centimeter per second or less. We were able to make atomic clocks that were on the order of a part in 10 to the 16. And that's what we have today. The, the cesium atom defines what we mean by a second, and we uh, use that definition using these laser-cooled atomic clocks. We use laser light to cool down gas of cesium atoms to below one millionth of a degree above absolute zero and make these incredible clocks. But today, the thing that really excites me is there's a new generation of clock coming along. The cesium clocks operate at microwave frequencies, about nine gigahertz, about nine billion cycles per second. The new clocks are operating at much higher frequencies, at the frequencies that correspond to visible light or uh, near infrared or sometimes near ultraviolet light. The frequency of these clocks is on the order of a few times 10 to the 14 cycles per second. Now 10 to the 14 is 100 million million. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, that's how many cycles it is. But these clocks are good to better than a part in 10 to the 18. That's better than one second in the age of the universe, which is about 14 billion years. That's how good these clocks are. But they're not part of the international system of units. They're not part of our official uh, measurement system because we have to vote internationally on changing the definition of the second. Right now the definition of the second is based on cesium and we have to change that definition and uh, this coming Thursday, two days from now, we're going to have a discussion, an open discussion, uh, a panel discussion in Versailles about how we're going to do this and we probably won't make a decision for a few years and we probably won't put it into effect for another few years, but sometime in the near future, we're going to have a new definition of what we mean by a second that is better than the old definition by more than two orders of magnitude, by more than a factor of 100. This is really exciting. So why do we care about having clocks that are good to this level of precision? Well, one reason uh, that really excites me is that we can use these clocks to do a new kind of physics experiment that we haven't been able to do at this level before. Einstein told us that if you had two clocks of different kinds, as long as they didn't depend on gravity like a pendulum clock, so if you had two different kinds of atomic clocks, that the ticking rate of those clocks would change as you move them up and down in a gravitational field. The effect is pretty small. It's a part in 10 to the 16 per meter. So it's not the sort of thing that you see in your everyday life, but it's something that's really important when you have clocks that are that good, as good as a part in 10 to the 18. That means you could see the gravitational effect 
of just one centimeter of change. Now imagine doing an experiment where you put two clocks of different kinds that according to Einstein should behave in the same way. Put those two clocks in a satellite that is sometimes close to the Earth and sometimes far away from the Earth, what we call an elliptical orbit, and measure the ratio of those two clocks as the satellite continues doing this for months or years so we get lots and lots of data, really high quality data, we'll be able to test what Einstein predicted at a level that has never been possible before. And one of the reasons why this is important is that one of the great unsolved problems of our present time in physics is we do not know how to put together Einstein's theory of gravity and the theory of quantum mechanics for which we're celebrating a hundred year anniversary. This is the International Year of Quantum Science and Technology. But quantum mechanics and, and gravity, as, as explained by Einstein, don't really work together properly. So that means that a unified theory is going to have to do something that changes either quantum mechanics or gravity or both. And this might give us a, uh, an insight into something wrong with Einstein's theory of gravity, which has been annoyingly correct every time we've tried to, to test it. But now we'd be testing it at a level that's never been possible before. And this could really change our understanding of the way physics works.